morning, everyone, and good morning again for those of you who I greeted at, at the top of the hour. Uh, my name is Gary Painter, and I direct the Homelessness Policy Research Institute, or HPRI as we call it. Um, as many of you know who are joining us today, HPRI's mission is to accelerate equitable and culturally informed solutions to homelessness in LA County by advancing knowledge and fostering transformational partnerships between research, practice, and policy. And one way we do that is by convening these sorts of engagements that combine both researchers and those who are in practice to talk about really critical issues of the day. Before us today, we actually have uh, a, a really exciting event because um, there's so much in the news right now about opening schools, figuring out how best to do that. What I haven't heard nearly as much is what about those kids who are either experiencing homelessness or kids who are doubled up and in housing precarious situations. So this is especially um, relevant here today. Um, today what we're going to begin with is two so short research presentations on homelessness among students who are in K through 12. Uh, these are young scholars from UCLA and USC. We have Earl Edwards from UCLA's Graduate School of Education. We have Dr. Soledad de Gregario and Tasman Dollywall from USC. And then we're going to move into a panel discussion with a terrific group of panelists, including Charles Evans from School on Wheels, Jennifer Kotke from the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and Melissa Pena from Green Dot Public Schools. Um, there are bios for our speakers that are online, so please look at those to get a fuller description of their work. In their opening remarks, they'll also introduce that. Um, I also encourage you to tweet your thoughts and observations from today's events. Our Twitter handle at HPRI underscore LA. Again, at HPRI underscore LA. Throughout the discussion, both the research presentations and the uh, panelist discussion, you'll have the opportunity to type in your own question and answers in the question and answer box in the Zoom, uh, the, the Zoom portal. Um, and we're going to collect them and field them for our panelists and presenters at the end of the panel. Um, so to begin, please join me in welcoming Tasman Dollywall and Dr. Soledad de Gregario to begin our research presentations. They will immediately then be followed by Earl Edwards from UCLA. Hi everyone, um, my name is Soledad de Gregorio. So Tasminda and I will be presenting some of our work around student homelessness in LAUSD. And I'll first provide some context and initial findings from our work. And then Tasman will present one of the studies we are working on and discuss some policy implications a little bit more in depth. So first of all, educational settings use the definition from the McKinney-Vinto Homeless Assistance Act, which includes first students that are sleeping in spaces that are not intended for such purposes, students who are sleeping in shelters, motels, hotels, or trailers, and third, students who are re residing in other people's homes, those who we call uh, doubled up, as long as it's a temporary arrangement. If it's long-term, it's not considered uh, homelessness. And the definition used by other agencies um, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, for example, is a more li literal definition. It's based on individuals that lack of primary nighttime residents in a space intended for such purposes, and they do not consider individuals living doubled up as homeless. So that's the main, um, the main difference for education, that they include uh, doubled up as homeless. And as an example, this eight-year-old little girl, she's doing homework in the garage where she lives with her family. This is considered homelessness because the garage has not been um, accommodated for living. Um, this mom who lives with her four kids bouncing from one motel to another. And then this is the line of families outside the Union Rescue Mission in downtown Los Angeles trying to get a spot for the night at the shelter with their families. And if you're wondering how widespread homelessness is among families and school age children, um, and HUD, rep HUD reports, so going back to the more literal definition, find that across the U.S., one out of every five homeless persons is a child under 18. So since this is not considered doubled up homelessness, this 
is a surprisingly high number if 20% of homeless persons are, are actually children. And more than half of them are experiencing homelessness in large urban areas. So there is a concentration in large cities. And as such, large public school districts are seeing increasing numbers of students experiencing homelessness with, um, we see 1.5 million students being identified as homeless in the 2017-18 school year. And as an example, in the largest school districts across the US, 8% uh, of public school students in New York City were homeless, 5% of students in Chicago, and 7% in DC. And although the percentage for LAUSD is lower, it's closer to 3.5%, we can see that the number has grown. And in the 2018-19 school year, we see 17,187 students being identified as homeless. And homelessness rising in public schools is worrisome because there is evidence that experiencing homelessness is associated with negative educational outcomes. And these include lower academic achievement or academic functioning, lower school attendance, and a higher likelihood of being retained. It's not clear whether it's homelessness itself that's associated with a lower academic achievement or if the impacts are actually because they are attending school fewer days or they have higher um, rates of school mobility. So that's an area in which research um, can look into. Um, and there is legislation in, in place that protects homeless students. There's the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act. It was first passed in 1987, and it's intended to guarantee homeless children's right to attend school and to remain in a school even if they move outside the attendance boundary. The, att the intention is to encourage homeless youth to continue to stay in school and to give them some stability where they might feel safer and continue their connection with other services. So, so to not lose that connection. Um, so the act itself defines homelessness using the definition I already described. It outli outlines protections for homeless students like remaining in the same school even if they move outside of the boundary, providing uh, transportation if they need it. And it provides formula grants to states. So there is there are nominal funds that are tied to um, student identification of homelessness. And with respect to the identification, schools are required to identify and report the number of homeless students annually. They do so through um, the student housing questionnaire. Also, it's also called a student residency questionnaire. This is a form that goes out in the registration packets at the beginning of the school year every year. And families are asked to identify to say yes or no if they live in any of the residences that are in the homeless definition and to identify in which one. So for example, shelter or garage. Um, and this form can be updated at any time during the school year as students may go in or out of homelessness. And some background information in, in LAUSD, most homeless students are doubled up. And this is a case across the US as well. Um, we see here that in LAUSD, 56% of students are living in another family's house or apartment. 10% are living in other types of residences that are not listed. 7% motel or hotel, 7% shelter, and then distributed across the other ones. What's a little bit surprising about this 56% is that actually in California, 85% of students are doubled up. So there's something going on here in LAUSD. It might be the identification, it might be that, uh, uh, that students are actually choosing to put a different category than disclosing that they're living doubled up for fear of eviction or something like that. Um, but this is definitely something to uh, look into. And secondly, homeless students are more likely to be racial minorities, particularly black and um, what's termed as other here. And if you look on the left, that's the distribution of races within the general student population. And on the right, it's the distribution in the homeless population. So some things to highlight is that um, white students go from 10% in the general population to only 4% of the homeless student population is white. Latino goes from 74 to 69, which um, since there's such a large proportion, that difference isn't as important. But if you see black goes from 
in the general population to 19% of the homeless student population is black. Um, and other goes from one to five. So students that are black or um, classified or categorized as other races um, are significantly more likely to experience homelessness. And our work with Tasman and Gary Painter and Ad Owens begun working with Slate Z as an evaluation partner. And this homelessness in schools was one of the issues that they were interested in. So as background, we started looking more broadly at homelessness within the district. And some initial themes of our research were using LAUSD student level data from the 2008-2009 to the 2016-17 school year. And we aim to describe students experiencing homelessness, identify the effects of homeless experiences on academic and behavioral outcomes, um, examine the distribution of homeless students across schools and neighborhoods in Los Angeles, and examine how they move across schools and neighborhoods when and after they experience homelessness. Tasman will focus on the second study here, and I'll go really quickly through the first. Um, so, we find first that not only are homeless students more likely to be minority students, we also find that they are more likely to be disadvantaged on a variety of other indicators. So they're more likely, and these are students in the 2016-17 school year. Um, they're more likely to be English learners. They're more likely to be eligible for special education services. They're more, they're more likely to be eligible for free and reduced price lunch. And in terms of outcomes, they're more likely to score, score lower math tests and attend fewer days of school. And finally, in our trying to tease out the causal link with academic outcomes, what we do is we focus on the two cohorts of eighth graders in the last two years of our data. So we can look at their trajectory from third through eighth grade and compare students that experience homelessness to students that do not experience homelessness. And findings, um, we find that a strong negative relationship between homelessness and outcomes, finding that students who experience homelessness first score lower on math tests, they attend fewer days of school, and we find that these effects occur in the year that they are homeless and the years after homelessness. The effects are larger in the year um, that they experience homelessness, but they continue after. And just as, as a quick example, um, in the year they are homeless, students miss an additional 11 days of school. Uh, the average student misses seven, so they're missing 18 total days of school, which is more than twice the average student, and it's also equivalent to more than three full weeks of school. Um, and as they move out of homelessness, they miss an average of five days of school. So that, with that, I will pass it on to Desmond. Okay, great. Thank you, Soledad. All right, excellent. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Tasmin Dhaliwal. I'm a doctoral candidate at the USC Rosier School of Education, and I'm going to spend some time talking through one of the study, studies that's part of the research agenda that Soledad mentioned. So in this study, we examined the school and neighborhood context of students experiencing homelessness in LAUSD and how frequently these contexts change over time. We focus on schools, neighborhoods, and mobility because we know that schools and neighborhoods can serve as a source of support for students, and in the case of schools, even stability in the lives of students experiencing homelessness. Um, these are contexts where students can access resources and where they can also tap into social support. But the research on K-12 homeless students doesn't tell us much about where they attend school or where they live. Mobility or the process of changing schools um, and neighborhoods is generally associated with negative impacts for students overall. And as Soledad mentioned, um, in the case of homeless students, there's evidence that mobility at least partially explains some of those negative consequences of homelessness. Because mobility has these documented negative consequences, under the McKinney-Vinto Act, there are a couple of protections put in place in order to promote stability. So students who have to move outside of their neighborhood attendance zone for their neighborhood schools because of 
because they are homeless, actually have the right to remain in their origin school under McKinney Binto. And in some cases, the district must provide transportation um, to their origin school. Um, districts um, also have to ensure that the moves that homeless students make if they move schools um, while they are homeless are in their best interest as well under McKinney Binto. In this study, we explore two research questions. Um, our first research question asks, what are the characteristics of homeless student schools and neighborhoods and how are students spatially distributed in schools and communities? And our second research question asks, how do the characteristics of where students attend school and where they live change during and after becoming homeless? So I'm gonna focus on the second research question for this presentation, um, but very briefly for our first research question, we find that homeless students are spatially clustered within the district and tend to um, attend lower achieving schools with more marginalized students, student groups and live in disadvantaged neighborhoods. There are um, many ways we could describe a school or neighborhood. So we generate two measures of each. These measures are designed to capture the resources present within the school and the neighborhood. And because we know that there is underinvestment in schools and neighborhoods with more um, groups from marginalized backgrounds, we use variables related to student and um, demographic composition to construct these measures. We use quantitative methods and data from students enrolled in LAUSD for our study. And we focus on students who are identified as homeless by the district and their first homeless incidents. We also limit our neighborhood analysis to doubled up students, since we know shelters decide to locate in particular neighborhoods to serve their clients. So we want to exclude shelter users from this analysis. I'll take you through our descriptive statistics um, in this presentation, but we also see similar results when we use regression analysis. So in order to analyze our research questions, we generate three time periods that are around a student's first homeless incident, the years before, during and after exiting homelessness. And within each time periods, we take a look at how frequently they move and also if they make upwards moves to significantly more advantaged schools and neighborhoods by our measures, um, downwards moves to more disadvantage or if they make lateral moves. And we find that students change schools frequently, but many of these moves are generally upward when it comes to school mobility. So here we see that once students become homeless, um, they are much more likely to change schools despite the protections offered by McKinney Vinto. But um, across time, and even when a student um, does become homeless, the moves they make are generally upward moves to more advantaged schools. However, these schools are generally relatively more disadvantaged than the average school in the district. So even though they're making upward moves, it's really um, upward to less disadvantage. And then when it comes um, to neighborhood changes, uh, we again find that students change addresses frequently, um, and especially during um, they, when they become homeless, uh, the majority of our students change their address. Of course, in reality, all students that become homeless change addresses, but these are not always updated in our data. And here we find that um, students generally make lateral moves or moves to neighborhoods that are in the same um, decile of neighborhood disadvantage. So just to quickly summarize some of our findings here, we find that students ex that experience homelessness attend more disadvantaged schools and live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods. And these students face multiple instabilities once they become homeless. They become homeless, so they change residence. Many times they also change schools and neighborhoods despite protections offered by McKinney Binto. 
but however, moves to schools are generally more advantage, which is consistent with McKinney-Bento's best interest guidance, um, while neighborhood moves are generally similar. So just a couple of implications for implementing McKinney-Bento. Um, first, there is a need to better identify homeless students, including using proactive identification. Um, our results also suggest that students are highly mobile, even once they're identified. So these students could be potentially flagged by a district and school homeless liaisons to follow up with families to make sure they understand their, um, their rights to remain in their origin school if they don't want to change schools. Um, the fact that we find clustering of homeless students um, within the district um, provides an opportunity to concentrate support services. And we also find that, dis that homeless students are more likely to exit the district, which means that there is an opportunity for more regional approaches to identifying supporting homeless students. And just um, and and we'd also just like to quickly conclude with some potential implications um, for distance learning and how to implement McKinney Vinto during distance learning. Our data and our research all occurred from before the pandemic, and McKinney Vinto was certainly written for in-person instruction. Our panelists will be speaking more about what it means to support homeless students during the pandemic. But just a couple of thoughts here. Identification is can it will continue to be key and will require likely being more proactive. Um, homeless students are going to require more support to truly engage in distance learning and districts may need to consider how to support um, and even prioritize homeless students when they create reopening plans for in-person instruction, of course, when that time is right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tasman. And we're really excited to have Earl Edwards to present his really complimentary qualitative research. Um, his study has been published and we'll provide a link to that to everyone who's attending the session um, and also put it up on the Homelessness Policy Research Institute's website so that you can, can find that research. Tasman's and Soledad's research is still in process. When it is published, we will uh, do the same. We will put that up on the HPRI website. Uh, for those of you who are, again, just joining us, you have the opportunity to ask questions through the question and answer feature. I see that there's a hand raise, but we would ask you um, to go ahead and type out your question for us. Earl. All right, so I'm uh, very excited to, uh, to be here with everybody. Um, and i um, happy to go um, after those uh, two projects because I think it really um, positions uh, my research uh, really well. Um, so the title of my presentation is Seeing the Village. And it's really looking at how, what systems of support students are actually utilizing when they're experiencing homelessness. Um, as mentioned, um, I'm a doctoral candidate at UCLA Graduate School of Education. Um, however, before that, I was actually a teacher. I taught for six years. Um, I'm also an experiential learning specialist. So I uh, have I started my own mentoring program um, in Providence, Rhode Island, Brockton, Massachusetts, and also one in South Central Los Angeles. And um, I'm also a, a product of, of experiencing homelessness. So I actually experienced homelessness for six years growing up. Uh, so all those experiences kind of really come together um, with my research and it kind of informs kind of the work I actually do. Um, so one of the things that um, we see when we actually disseriate the um, data is actually that there is this discrepancy that we have when um, individuals are experiencing homelessness when you break it down by, by race. So this chart is um, from 2017-18, looking at the four-year adjusted cohort graduation rate for students experiencing homelessness in LA County. And what it shows is that while um, the graduation rates overall are, are low compared to the 80%, 83% um, 80, uh, graduation rate for the typical student in LA County, um, it's, ex it's extremely low when you look at it broken down by race. So black, um, black young boys are actually graduating at 55% um, rate, um, which is extremely alarming. When one in two um, black youth who have been identified as experiencing homelessness is, um, is not actually making it out of school. Uh, we look at um, discipline data, you also notice that black students who are experiencing homelessness are actually more likely to be suspended 
than, um, than their peers that are experiencing homelessness. And also, um, even when you compare that to um, other black students who are living in low income um, or have free reduced lunch. So there is definitely something going on with race um, while we're looking at uh, homelessness. And too often we talk about homelessness as an aggregate and we don't actually break it down to see what are the racial differences that are actually happening within those experiences. So my research is really um, framed from a perspective of structural racism, recognizing that, um, that race plays a, a factor in, in, in how our society is actually formed and the different institutions that we have in our society um, have institutional racism, uh, interpersonal racism and historical racism that impacts how individuals navigate that space. Um, so really kind of having this as a frame when we're coming into looking at students experiencing homelessness, recognizing that other institutions outside of just the school um, may be a factor um, when looking at these individuals' experiences. Um, another really important framework that I utilize for my research is uh, community culture well. So recognizing that there's a structural um, element to what's happening within the homeless experience, but also there's individual agency that's happening as well. And looking at community cultural wealth provides us an opportunity to really look at the different types of capital that, um, that students, uh, particularly black students, bring um, to the overall experience that allows them to help navigate through different systems. Um, Yoso's um, um, really expand on Budo's uh, idea of cultural capital by having aspirational capital in terms of what your hopes and dreams, familiar capital in terms of what family members are bringing and supporting you. Um, in addition to social capital, navigational capital, um, resistance capital in terms of being able to try to push yourself beyond um, statistics, in addition to linguistic capital and being able to navigate different spaces, um, knowing how to talk uh, and navigate those spaces that others may not uh, have the capacity to do. So my research questions were really focused on um, black students and how do black students um, living in uh, Los Angeles County, attending high school in Los Angeles County, able to navigate school while experiencing homelessness. Um, and in particular, what are the unique challenges that those uh, students had uh, while trying to graduate and experience while, while also experiencing homelessness? And the last question was, um, how did high school teachers, counselors, administrators, and other staff and adults um, support them during the journey? Um, this research project was an anti-deficit perspective. So what I actually went out to do was actually talk to um, individuals that actually um, experienced homelessness before they would graduate. But too often our conversations around a student's experience of homelessness focuses on individuals that don't um, graduate or don't meet the outcomes that, um, that are favorable within our society. And we overlook that a lot of individuals are actually um, succeeding and we can learn from their actual experiences. So the methods, uh, I interviewed eight individuals from in nine, 90 to 180 minutes, uh, three cycles of uh, bottom-up approach um, analysis and had a lot of clarification calls, uh, draft reviews, and also had my colleagues at UCLA kind of look over my code book to really make sure that what I'm finding is um, something that they will find as well if they did the research. So this is just the sample. Um, there were four um, black, um, black men and four um, black women that were a part of the SETI. The years they graduated varied, um, and also the districts they graduated varied. Um, many of them, experience doubled up um, living in addition to uh, other forms of um, houselessness. And in terms of the duration, the, the, the shortest time was uh, six months, the uh, longest time was three years. And um, all these individuals were able to graduate um, and, um, and, and, and currently are kind of working either in college or doing work that is actually benefiting the, the actual overall community. So three, three themes that came up during my research was one, um, majority of the participants I interviewed didn't um, actually utilize McKinney Mental Homes Assistance Act. Um, one of the things I was able to do is really uh, go out to the community and try to find individuals for the study. So I didn't rely on um, homeless liaisons, which allowed me to have a sample that may not be um, captured by homeless liaisons. Um, another major uh, theme was anti-Black school climate was a barrier that students talked about um, in their experience while experiencing homelessness. Now, it was, uh, wasn't just because they were homeless, it was because they were black, they were experiencing this, but it was compounded by the fact that they didn't have uh, housing security. 
and also in preventing them from actually um, utilizing and getting services um, for what, when they were experiencing homelessness. And the third one that's going to focus on is meaningful relationships with Black adults and also Black community organizations was um, two of the, the main factors they uh, attributed to their ability to actually graduate high school. Um, so this is a, a chart just showing um, who actually notified their school district on um, them experiencing homelessness and if they actually even knew about the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act. And as you can see, um, only two um, participants actually notified the school district out of the, out of the eight. And only one student, Dion, actually knew about the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act and decided not to utilize it. Um, this is really important because all the participants had, um, with the exception of the ones that utilized it in Dayon, had needs that could have been um, resolved by the McKinney Mental Homeless Assistance Act. However, they didn't know about it and didn't ask for it. Um, Dayon um, knew about it, but felt like his community was supporting him enough that he didn't need those, um, those resources, so he didn't notify his school. Now, meaningful relationships with Black adults um, was extremely important. Um, when we look at who they were talking to, so I asked them, um, who did they disclose their, um, their homeless experience to? Um, often it was uh, uh, an adult, um, a black, and usually it was a black male, a black, a black, black person. So for example, Marcus um, disclosed to three people. Um, one was a, a black history teacher that he built a relationship and saw as a mentor. Another one was an Indian male teacher that um, took um, interest in him and actually um, did a lot of tutoring after school, which allowed them to actually to establish a relationship. And um, a lot of them have also utilized community-based organizations. So for example, um, going to the library, uh, being a part of a basketball team, um, church became a, a big theme as well. In addition to um, some actually utilized in traditional um, outreach centers for, uh, for, for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, this is just a quote from one of the participants, um, kind of talking about why church became uh, one of the places that allowed him to get support. So in high school, I started going to this church. She, the pastor, pretty much gave me the floor to talk about anything that was bothering you and anything that you, that you wanted to tell her. She was pretty supportive and always prayed for me. It kind of motivated me a lot, you know, because church is all about uplifting people. It helped me out a lot. And um, Robert actually started going to church um, during the time he was experiencing homelessness. And we really want to emphasize the, the, the reason for him going. It really was because he needed a space to actually share and actually allowed to actually share um, his vulnerability. And that's one of the things that he said he didn't feel like he had when he was actually in school. Also, um, kind of going back to another theme in terms of the anti-blackness that was happening in school. A lot of individuals talked about um, either one low expectations of their teachers and, and their staff that made them feel like no one cared about them at school. And when I asked them if they had a caring relationship with, uh, with teachers, a lot of them couldn't name uh, a teacher that they actually felt that actually cared about them. Um, another um, way a manifestation of anti-blackness occurred was through the relationship with, um, with um, Latinx and uh, Hispanic students. Um, so some of them talked about um, uh, regional conflicts in terms of like gang violence um, and also going to majority um, Latinx schools. Um, so I think one, uh, one phenomena that isn't talked about enough in LA County is that majority of uh, black students go to uh, our, our minorities within their schools. And while there's not a lot of white students that they're actually interacting with, they're interacting with Latinx students. Um, and we don't spend enough time actually trying to build relationships um, between these two populations. And as a result of it, it can be an alienating process uh, for, for some students when they're actually going to these schools. Um, so building meaningful relationships were extremely important. And so just kind of go back to the cultural capital uh, um, that these individual students had. Now they were able to access and have um, black mentors, um, black school adults, um, black community-based organizations. But one thing that was clear that those individuals did not know anything about the McKinney Mental Home Assistance Act. Um, so as a result, um, these youth did never receive the, any of the social capital that would allow them to utilize and see the McKinney Mental Home Assistance Act as a resource for them. Um, while they were able to graduate high school, it's, it's important to recognize that 
their ability to um, to do as well in high school was jeopardized as a result of having to utilize different resources and also have a lot of unmet needs that they had to overcome and um, and and get past rather than actually have a school environment and a system that was actually designed to actually help them and support them. Um, uh, an example that comes to mind is um, a young lady named Malini. And she was um, a straight A student, a ninth grade year, um, became homeless, um, living in a motel when she was in 10th grade. Her mother uh, ended up leaving her and, and moving to Nevada. And she ended up living on the streets and living in shelters. And during that whole time period, no one at school knew she was experiencing homelessness. She would literally bring her tent um, in, her, in a bag to, uh, to school every day and no one, no one knew. Uh, she was able to actually get to um, senior year and was applying to colleges and her uh, college advisor was very, very unhelpful. And she said she wanted to apply to eight different schools, um, SC being one of them, um, and Howard University. And the, her advisor basically told her that she was applying for too hard and too rigorous of schools and she should be just applying to Cal State. Um, she ended up um, actually applying and, and she only school that she didn't get into was at SC. She got a wait list at SC. Shame on you, SC. <laughs> and, but um, she didn't go to, end up going to college because um, she didn't put down um, her actual payment for holding her spot at Howard University. And because she was navigating by herself, she didn't realize that she could have just called the university and told them that oh, I'm actually experiencing homelessness. I don't have the resources to be able to hold my spot. Um, can you, can, can that be waived? And she could have had that waived and attended school. Um, unfortunately, she didn't. Um, she ended up committing to Howard, not being able to go, and then having to not go to school for the first year because her uh, financial aid package was actually connected to Howard. And because she couldn't go to Howard, uh, because she didn't have the money and she didn't have the flight, to go there, um, she ended up um, not going to school for um, a year, which turned into two or three years. Um, and fortunately, she was able to find a community and also find work and, and working in homeless services and helping individuals that are experiencing similar, similar patterns. But her trajectory was very different as a result of not having the support systems that she needed and she deserved. Um, so it's very, very important that we're recognizing that when we're doing this work, it's extremely important that the awareness of McKinney Mental is not just the homeless liaison um, or one or two people within the school, but it is a broader community-based organization that actually are knowing about this and are able to advocate on our children's behalf. Uh, lastly, it's very important that community-based organizations, Black community-based organizations, become formal partners in supporting students experiencing homelessness. Um, just to end, I, um, I, was a, I started a mentoring program in South Central Los Angeles. I had about 15 students um, a youth in that, in that program, um, two thirds of them experienced homelessness at some time in their life. And that wasn't a requirement of the actual program. Um, and so it just shows the prevalence of um, homelessness within um, LA County. Um, and the work I was doing with them was um, around supporting them in terms of leadership, mentorship and college access. Um, I wasn't a formal partner with any, any school district then. A lot of the organizations aren't formal partners, but they're experiencing and working with kids who are experiencing homelessness every day. Um, we need to really kind of broaden out who we, who we see as being part of this village and how we can create formal partnerships and make sure that these students are being supported in school, but also within the greater community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Earl. There was a couple of questions just for clarification um, on, on both sets of studies. Earl, there was a question about the geography of where those students were drawn from. Did you, was there a particular portion of LA Unified School District that, that your students that you interviewed were from? Yes, so, um, so two of them were, um, were from LA Unified. This actually was a county perspective. Oh. So they came from um, different districts um, in the LA County area. But all those uh, counties were, um, were mostly like um, cities. Okay, great. And then there was a question about um, the median length of a homeless spell, and perhaps either Soledad or Tasman can share a little bit about what we know about students who experience just one spell, and if so, how long it is. Um, you may or may not have that data at the ready, but if you do. Uh, yeah, I just looked it up, and at least um, for students in eighth grade who have experienced homelessness by eighth grade, um, and this is data from 2016-17 school year, 
um, they have experienced an average of 2.4 years of homelessness, although about 40% experience only one year of homelessness at a time. Um, some students fall out of the district after that, so we're not confident enough to say they only experience one year of homelessness because we don't know what happens, um, but that's what we see in the data. Thank you. And then Ellie is our uh, program manager at HPRI. Is there any other questions before we transition to the panel? Yeah, Gary, just one more question. Um, someone asked if Earl found any link between foster care history and homelessness among black students. So the participants I um, interviewed um, didn't have any involvement with uh, foster care. However, one of the um, one of the forms that was kind of weaponized against them was this um, the fear of um, being taken away from the families. So a lot of them talked about um, not disclosing in school because of counselors um, misrepresenting homelessness to be neglect, and um, and teachers actually threatening to call social uh, social services or open the case on them if they misbehaved. So um, so while they didn't experience foster care um, in my sample, um, they were very very aware and very hypersensitive, and um, and they navigated the school space with that in mind. Great, thank you. So let's, uh, again, we can virtually clap our hands. Um, and thank you to all the researchers for presenting this really important work to shine light on how um, students are experiencing homelessness and the surroundings and the circumstances that they face. And then to, to Earl's study, you know, some of those pathways of success, which as you, as you noted are really, really critical. So now we're gonna turn to the panel, but we'll keep the researchers with us because as, especially as we move to question and answer time broadly with the audience, they may also have some additional insights. But I wanna ask just a general question for each of the panelists. And in so doing, if you could also describe the work, the position you have in your organization and then, and then kind of how you engage with students who are experiencing homelessness specifically. But I wondered, given the context that we have seen over the last decade of more and more students experiencing homelessness, whether it's HUD's definition or McKinney-Vento's definition, curious how your work has shifted and changed. Uh, and why don't we go ahead and begin with Charles, who's the CEO of School on Wheels. Hey Gary, thanks. I missed that last part of your question that you asked earlier. I was just asking how your practice has changed as the number of students experiencing homelessness has increased. Welcome, thank you. So I'm Charles, uh, the Executive Director of School on Wheels, and uh, we're a nonprofit organization that provides educational assistance to students experiencing homelessness. And uh, we do that in six different counties throughout Southern California. And um, the majority of the work that we do is in um, connection directly with shelters. So we have, um, Pre-COVID, we had about a thousand active volunteer tutors that would go to various homeless shelters throughout Southern California and meet with uh, an individual student that they were matched with. Um, the the as I think as uh, Soledad and Tasman pointed out, the the makeup, the demographics of where homeless students are actually living, um, primarily comprises in uh, doubled up situations. And unfortunately, we just don't have the resources to provide tutoring services for double up students, but we do provide tutoring services for the HUD definition. So those students that are living in motels and shelters and foster group homes are in the streets of Southern California. Um, so we provide, the majority of our services are provided directly at the shelters and we work with most shelters, but we've always found um, a harder time identifying those students living in motels. Um, so, in identifying those students, we really rely on our partnerships with the school district. Um, I think both, I think it was Soledad who pointed out the student residency questionnaire form that families fill out. So we try to connect with the homeless liaison or the homeless counselor, depending on the school or the district. And we try to get those referrals from students that are living in motels directly from the schools. So as the number of homeless uh, students actually increase, a lot of them are actually living in doubled up situations or they need motels or the vehicles. So that extra outreach that we have to do is, is basically developing and enhancing relationships with the school districts. Great. Thank you so much, Charles. Jennifer, I wondered if you could share a little bit about from your perspective at the county's Office of Education, how, how your approaches and your practices have changed as the number of homeless students has increased. 
Yes, good morning. So my name is Jennifer Kotke and I work with the Los Angeles County Office of Ed Education. And I'm specifically the homeless education coordinator for the county, um, which is very large. Obviously, LA County is extremely large. We have 80 districts within LA County. Um, LAUSD is one of those 80 districts. Um, so it's, uh, I always say they're one, and then we have 79 others, except LAUSD is one of our largest. Um, and then also, um, we have over 350 plus charter schools. So that's another thing that um, really needs to also be uh, put into the equation is that our charter schools also have a lot of our, our, um, our homeless uh, students or students experiencing homelessness. Um, so that's just kind of a depth and breadth of the work that I do. My job is really to ensure educational rights um, for those in homeless education and to support the liaisons that sit inside of each of our districts and inside of our charter schools. So it's a very, very uh, large uh, position. Um, if you are aware of homeless education um, state funding wise, our funding is very limited. And so um, I, I call myself the one woman band um, because I, I, I am it at the county office for homeless education. So I really do rely on uh, partners and partnerships with those around me. And that's how we really do the work to support the ever increasing population for our homeless uh, students. And so we have a very deep partnership in particular with LASA. Um, we do a lot of very rich work with them. We have educational coordinators that sit within their access points um, to support youth who are coming in through the HUD doors. Um, because HUD is, is different than McKinney-Vento. Um, and uh, close to about 80% of our students, um, because of their doubled up status, most likely will not be able to access HUD services. And so, and those doubled up populations um, seem to grow on a pretty regular basis. So again, our, our, our partnerships with, like Charles with um, School on Wheels is huge. We have uh, partnerships with uh, Feed the Children, supplybank.org. Each of these partnerships are, are critical. The other pieces that um, we really push in on are training, training school employees. It's super important, and that's both federal and state requirement um, that employees are trained about students. And that's everything from your administrators to your classroom teachers, department. So really the training component is very important, and that's to help with identification, um, especially during uh, uh, COVID. And then we really also do push in on, on policy. So we have had some um, continued conversation about prevention care um, for those doubled up populations in HUD and really trying to work with our loss of systems and our HUD systems um, about concerns tied to policy. Um, we know that you know, HUD and, and uh, the policies behind HUD and the policies behind McKinney um, are many, many years in the, in the making and so um, the hope is, is that at some point in time, there might be more preventative services, um, particularly for our doubled up population because it's so big. So as our populations continue to grow, um, we just continue to uh, look for different ways to reach out. And, and I hope that gives you kind of a sense. Uh, it's pretty broad brush, so. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. And you set up Melissa Pena's uh, kind of introduction well as a member of a charter school or network. Um, how, how have the increase in, in the number of homeless students impacted your work? Um, yeah, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, so I am, uh, I work with Green Dot Public Schools. We're a, a charter network. Um, we run 19 charter schools, middle and high schools in LA. Um, and we serve about 11,000 students. Uh, I, last year, about 500 of our students were identified as homeless. And um, to what Soledad and Tasminda had mentioned, about 90% of those were actually in a doubled up situation. Um, in terms of identifying students, especially with the increase in homelessness, I myself, and, and actually my role is much broader, I, I'm the homeless student liaison. Um, for our 19 schools. So really my job is to educate our schools and provide them with resources to better support our hom homeless youth. Um, but I have many other hats in our organization and, and you'll find that across districts that homeless liaisons don't just focus on the homeless youth population, but um, I myself am the foster youth liaison. I do health and wellness for our network. Um, and I also run a small case management program. It's like, you know, so 
um, that we can maybe touch on later as being one of the challenges. But in terms of identifying homeless youth, um, I think there's definitely been a lot of um, media, um, you know, news stories and whatnot that have really shined a light on the homeless student population and homelessness in general. And I think that's created a lot of interest um, and just, I, I think, made folks more aware um, about, you know, homelessness in, in our own schools. Um, I think one of the, the biggest areas that I really tried to do a lot of education around is on that doubled up population. Um, because when we talk about our teachers, when we talk about our counselors, our administrators, um, and of course our students and parents, like they don't understand the McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. Um, and you know, that's 90% of our homeless student population. And so if 90% um, of our homeless student population yeah, or, or 90 percent of them um, are doubled up that, and don't realize that that allows them the protections of McKinney Vento. Um, you know, that's a huge challenge. So, you know, one um, now with COVID, especially, it gives me a lot of you know latitude to be able to get in front of our students and educate them. You know, and let them know. You know, these. You know. These are the housing situations that might allow for additional protections and supports and services, maybe for you, maybe for your cousin, maybe for your friend, but educating our students um, and then also finding ways to start educating our families as well. So not just um, internally our teachers and counselors, but also, you know, our family members. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Melissa. So I, I feel like the, both the research presentations and even the, the you know, the, the initial comments from our distinguished practitioners have noted some challenges around identification, getting knowledge out, definitions and so forth. And I wondered for the panelists, have you experienced any challenges because there are multiple different kinds of definitions of homelessness? Um, if, if so, have you figured out ways to navigate that? This is just Jennifer. Um, a lot of what um, we do at the county is really to educate about the differences and to help people understand um, where where people fall, um, where students fall, um, because that's a big, and I think uh, Melissa had mentioned it really well too, um, is educating across the board, parents as well as staff, um, because parents may not realize that they fall under a McKinney protect, you know, McKinney Vento protections. Mm -hmm until they are actually educated. Um, we have a slide that we show constantly that lines up um, McKinney-Vento next to HUD um, so that there is a very clear understanding between the two. Um, and then we also have done some work around really trying to um, marry the systems together in some way. Um, again, we had mentioned, I had mentioned previously that we have educational coordinators that sit inside of the losses system, inside of um, the access points. And so the great thing about those particular staff members is that um, they have the ability to serve under HUD and connect to all the HUD services if a family or student falls under HUD, but they also have the ability to support and serve underneath McKinney. So if an individual or a family comes in and they, are, they don't meet the HUD definition, our McKinney, because of the funding stream underneath McKinney for these educational coordinators, they then can support them under McKinney and they can help to connect them back uh, to their local district. So it's kind of trying to think out of the box a little bit um, about when these families are coming. If they're not coming to a HUD access point, um, then again, the education is critical, especially at the, um, the district, district and site levels, so. Great, right, that, that's really helpful. Melissa or Charles, any, any other comments on that question? No, I mean, just, just to, to add what Jennifer said, we understand uh, statistically um, that the majority of students that are homeless are doubled up families. Um, and again, unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity to provide student services for families that are in a doubled up situation. However, we do partner you know, I think Earl kind of pointed out the, the importance of uh, mentor programs, but we do kind of partner with other organizations in various districts that we serve to be able to redirect those families that may not be able to qualify for our services, but definitely can get some type of guidance um, and support of other organizations. But it is really important to 
to, to continue to provide resources for all homeless individuals. So I, I think uh, many in our audience, as I kind of teed off the conversation today, are, are keenly interested in how the pandemic in particular has impacted your work and what, if any, promising practices you're starting to uncover and implement in the face of the pandemic. The reality is when it hit, none of us were prepared, yet we had to take decisive action. And, um, and so maybe, Charles, if you could begin to, to share a little bit about how your work has shifted and if you've seen some opportunities for, for growth, success, et cetera, as, as these shifts are taking place and as we face this upcoming year. Yeah, um, I mean, one of the, you know, the majority of our services were, uh, were provided in person. So our volunteers would go to shelters and they would meet students at library or directly on campuses. But obviously, due to COVID-19, we had to pivot to providing um, online tutoring. Um, and obviously, that, pre that has presented several challenges. Um, one of the biggest is being access to technology. And um, certainly after that would be um, reliable internet services. Um, so we are realizing that not only do we have to provide additional training for volunteers to now be able to tutor online, but we also have to provide training for our families to just be able to kind of navigate and access the different platforms that comes with, you know, providing uh, educational opportunities for your child. So we've been providing a lot more support. Um, we've been talking, uh, we already had a part of our program that dealt with social emotional learning. Um, but we realized that because of COVID-19, that's kind of been compounded um, with our, our students um, and just being um, kind of restricted to being in a, in a shelter or a motel. So it, it comes with the, uh, some additional challenges that I think we weren't initially aware of, but um, just ongoing training and support for our, our students. Um, we've been in a position where we, we were trying to provide a lot more tutoring as opposed to the one hour a week that we provided before. Um, so we're asking our volunteers to meet with their students um, a little bit more regularly than just an hour a week. Um, because in a lot of cases, we realize that we are in fact uh, the teacher for some of our students um, and that a lot more responsibility kind of lies in the hands of our volunteers. Um, so, you know, there's opportunities just to support our students a little bit more. Um, one of the things that have coming come out of uh, COVID is the fact that we don't have to drive as much. So geography is no longer an issue. So we've been able to kind of track our students' movement a little bit more. So as they may move from residence to residence, we're able to kind of stay connected with our student via and, you know, technology. So that's been one of the positive signs that has come um, out of this whole pandemic. Um, but we're, we're, we still have a lot to, to do in terms of training and, and support for our students. Um, and we're still trying to figure out how much of their education has been impacted as a result of them not being able to um, attend the traditional school. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, but we've been receiving a lot of support from the community, a lot of interest from um, uh, teachers and um, and um, uh, educators to provide additional support for our students. So we're just continuing to, to look at how we can better engage and support our families as they kind of navigate the space as well. Thank you, Charles. Jennifer and Melissa, how has your work shifted? I'm going to let Melissa go first since I talk so much. <laughs> um, you know, I, it's funny. I feel like it's, it's still shifting under my feet right now, like at this moment. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think within months, we're asking um, a system to create new systems and structures that have been created over centuries, you know, and solidified over centuries. So it's, it is moment to moment where I'm learning, well, how are we doing this now? How are we distributing food? How are we educating? So, and, and the trickiness as the liaison and, you know, as um, service providers within a, within a school system is, you you kind of look at what the system is looking like and and you tag you know, you tag on here you tag on there you help you know um identify opportunities where you can um plug in i think it has created an opportunity as systems are being built to be a part of that um which is helpful so that maybe there's um 
greater sense of like equity and building our systems of, oh, as you're thinking about how we're distributing food, make sure we're thinking about how are we going to get it to our homeless students who may not be able to get to that food distribution site. Or, you know, as you're thinking about um, whether or not you're going to ask students to have their cameras on in their, you know, their Google Classroom, consider the student that might be living in an in a overcrowded motel room, you know, and how are you going to support their privacy. So I think, um, if anything, it's allowed me to get ahead of the conversation a little bit. Um, and, you know, I, I think also technology, um, it has allowed us to capital allowed me to really capitalize on some of these technology pieces that I myself have been a little slow on. Like, how come this isn't on our school websites already? How come, you know, we we haven't um, pushed this into some of our um, student lessons? And so I think it's forcing me to even rethink about um, some of the more traditional practices that I've fallen into, and how do I um, start thinking? Of, a, be a little more forward thinking about um, outreach and, and um, service provision. Thanks, Melissa. Jennifer? Um, so the work has definitely shifted a lot of it too. And I, I think our um, our wonderful doctoral students had talked a lot about um, that there's like clusters of students and that, that happens across LA County. And so one of the things is really um, listening to the needs of our districts and what's happening in their particular area and then brainstorming with them about best ways to support because it's not a, um, it's not a, <laughs> like a rubber stamp. There is what works in one community does not necessarily uh, work in another community. So it's really important to be um, really responsive to what's happening in the community and the community partners, because there are a lot of community partners that have really risen to the occasion have, have come together. I've seen so many groups that have actually connected with one another um, because they know that they can get a better kind of bang out of their buck for coming together and supporting their community. And in doing so, again, that looks, each, each community looks very different. Um, some of the things that have also really shifted is really just um, the, the Wi-Fi and the technology has been just an ongoing, huge conversation, um, a conversation that's um, still very concerning um, because uh, even though I, I think we have attempted to do a, a fabulous job, we still have a lot of digital divide related issues, which contributes to learning loss. Um, and it's very problematic. I love Charles program. I can't say enough about his program because they do a lot with technology for students who are our most vulnerable population. But we do have a huge digital divide in the United States and it's very, very problematic um, for our, our students experiencing homelessness. Um, there's a couple other things that have also, we've really just tried to remind districts about is that there is a lot of movement uh, potentially going on right now. And they have to be really responsive to paying attention to that. Um, we have a lot of families who have come into homelessness that are brand new to homelessness. They've never been homeless before um, because of what's happening with the economy. And that's difficult for sometimes people to navigate. And so it's really important that our liaisons are, are just aware of that newness and that they know how to have those really, um, those really hard conversations with families about how to seek support. Um, school of origin is a big one. Um, so when a student leaves their district, we have been trying to talk to districts about um, thinking through their processes. So I think Melissa had talked a little bit about that too, is thinking through your processes. If we have a student um, and we're not driving anywhere and we have a student that has moved from one end of the LA County to the other, would it be best for the time being um, to allow that student to, re to remain in that school of origin with those technological devices even though they may be 100 miles away from their original school site, uh, in order to maintain continuity and um, to maintain their schooling um, for the time being while we're in this you know, digital world, because it may be better in order to help the student to avoid learning loss, um, because it does become problematic. If I jump from district to district to district and I'm trying to obtain technology from each of those districts, it's, it's very difficult. It's, it's, and that, that contributes, again, to the learning loss. There's lots of layers to all of this mm -hmm. that we just need to constantly be uh, thinking through and thinking about, so. 
I wonder if just again reflection in terms of the, the populations that all of you are working with, are you noticing that students um, since the pandemic began have been more or less mobile? Has it been more or less challenging to connect with them and remain connected to them? I think for us, I think we're gonna see that when we come back in two and mm -hmm. a half weeks. Okay. Um, I feel like at the beginning of the pandemic or, you know, our last quarter, um, there were some, you know, immediate safety nets that were put into place. And while, you know, the economy was falling, um, we hadn't, I, until the end of the school, I, until the end of the school year, I hadn't quite seen much impact yet, but I feel like coming back to school and what's, you know, the few months it's gone through the summer, mm -hmm. I feel like we're going to come back to a different situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. Um, Charles? I know, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Charles. Yeah, I was just going to say really quickly for us, we realize that we have to be a lot more flexible. Um, you know, we have tutoring sessions that take place as early as nine o'clock and as late as eight o'clock. Um, and that's because of the nature of the situation. Um, one thing that I, that I want to note as well is that I think we have to be really, I think, aware of some of our older students that might actually be maybe frontline workers themselves um, because of the economy. So we've noticed that a lot of our, our students in some cases are picking up these little odd jobs because they want to provide additional revenue and support for their family. And that was something that we didn't even think of. I mean, we we knew prior that some of our high school students work and they look to work so that they can support their families, especially when they're in a home situation. But now it's even more prevalent um, because students are trying to pick up um, the slack of maybe a parent or uh, a parent or an older sibling that may have lost a job due to, econ due to the economy. Jennifer? Um, and I just wanted to um, tandem on to the things that Melissa um, had mentioned. Um, in particular, one of the big things um, that we are concerned about um, is we're not, we're not sure about um, the mobility related pieces, but we are very concerned about the attendance related pieces. So a lot of what we have talked about with districts is um, if you are not doing in-person learning, it is, it is just as important to know who's attending as who's not attending and why they're not attending. And that there needs to be a team of people behind that teacher to support those students that are not attending and why they're not attending. Um, there has been uh, legislation that was just uh, passed recently called Assembly Bill 98. Um, which is a continuity plan um, piece that the districts have to put into place. And so um, one of the things that I have really tried to do, and, and actually within that legislation, um, there is um, specific uh, pieces that districts have to outline specifically for their homeless student population um, because of the concerns related to the digital divide. So I'm not sure so much about the mobility. My feeling is that there has been a ton of mobility, um, but our, what, what do on the ground level as far as districts is because we're in this virtual world is that we're actually um, quote unquote seeing students is via technology so it's that missing student that we're really trying to make sure that districts are paying attention to thanks Jennifer I'm going to turn it over to Ellie to um, ask some questions from the audience now make sure to get get those fully answered yeah, so um, I'll ask a few that we have here and, and folks in the audience, please feel free to continue um, typing your questions as they come up, both for um, the research presenters as well as any of the panelists. Um, and so I think maybe uh, Jennifer or Melissa, this question could be best directed at you. Someone asked how schools are working with housing programs to get families into permanent housing. Um, so from a county perspective, um, we, I talked a little bit about the educational coordinators. So when we, we do uh, remind our districts constantly about um, HUD and the services through LASA. We remind them about um, who their local education uh, coordinator is and how to contact them. Uh, we provide information about the local access points to their district. So we, we provide that information. Um, as far as actually getting in, them into permanent housing, that's, it's a long journey, um, very long journey for many of our families. 
Um, and a lot of the times it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's super not simple. So that's not a really great answer, but it's not, it's not a simple process. And so that's why we really encourage um, our districts to use our educational coordinators um, because they speak what I call HUD ease. Um, HUD language is different than McKinney language. Um, and it's almost like two people from two different parts of the world trying to have a conversation. So I feel like our educational coordinators are kind of like a translator and they can help the two sides talk. And so when a family and or a student is coming in and they're seeking support, um, from a liaison, the liaison can reach out to the educational coordinator and they can figure out how to help them um, in hopes of, of, of meeting the resource. What you have to remember is the definitions. And so if you have a family sitting in a doubled up situation, they will not qualify most likely for HUD services. And so just to give you kind of a rough estimate, these are approximation numbers. Um, 70, we have about 70,000 identified um, McKinney-Vento students within LA County. 80% of that, so about 50,000 of those students, won't qualify for HUD services. So um, if they do qualify, that's where our educational coordinator can help with the process. But there are so many um, that, that of, our, of, our, of our McKinney-Vento students that unfortunately are kind of left out of the HUD equation. So Again, good and bad, but it's really um, our job as, as, as at the county, as well as our districts to empower our districts to be creative about the process, so. Um, I echo what, what Jennifer shared. I utilize those resources that she actually puts out, you know, and just knowing um, the coordinated entry system, what are the access points um, for our schools as a charter, we, uh, charter organization, we have schools um, across different school districts. So we have schools in LAUSD, we have schools in Compton Unified, we have schools in um, Lenox. Um, and so um, knowing what are the access points um, within our schools and um, communities, and um, also knowing the, you know, the ed coordinators, and there's one ed coordinator I work with very closely where I do have a cluster um, of, of homeless students um, within particular um, school communities. And so really working with that person, but I think just to echo what Jennifer said, most of our families, because 90% of our families um, are in a doubled up situation, most of them don't qualify for, um, for even temporary shelter you know, support. And, and even families living in hotel motel, if they're paying for their own motel, um, they don't qualify until like the day that they don't have the money to pay for the next hotel night. So you literally have to wait for a family um, to, to be on the brink of literal homelessness before they can start accessing those services. And I think, you know, as, as a school district and as, you know, our teachers and counselors, you know, get really um, disillusioned by that by that point that, you know, we want to create that stability for our student. Um, but there's, there's just so much um, homelessness in our community that our system is overloaded. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I think that that's one of the challenges. And I just want to um, just want to add, um, I've been doing the work in this advocacy around the, with the county um, homeless initiative. And one big thing that is, um, a missed opportunity is really connecting families that are doubled up to homeless prevention uh, funds. So Measure H has, um, has, has money for prevention um, that is through BASTA and also through a lot of the different um, county departments for uh, rent relief, uh, for um, even if like a car breakdown, there's money that can be accessed. But the challenge is um, one, there hasn't been a lot of coordination within uh, within school districts around this around this um, money and funding, and um, too often we don't we don't utilize individuals that are doubled up as a population to then filter over to these prevention dollars. So while they don't um, qualify for HUD, and because the majority of the of, of the money is coming from HUD, um, we often just disregard the, uh, other opportunities and other other funds that we can utilize to help better support families. Thanks, Earl, um, and thanks, everyone. I'm going to move to another um, 
question now here around identification. Um, and I think um, Melissa, Jennifer, Charles, uh, really anyone can speak to this. Um, the question is, with no students on campus, how can we identify those with housing instability? The housing survey that Soledad mentioned, I believe, in her presentation was an undercount even in the best circumstances, this person says. Um, and now we don't have the staff, the staff observations to supplement. Um, does anyone, any of our panelists have thoughts on that? Maybe Jennifer, you can start, or Melissa, you're ready to go. Either, go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> yeah, I think on my end, um, that's where I feel like it's really important to focus on um, empowering our students and families with information and awareness. Um, and so I know on our end, I'm thinking about um, students and families, thousands of them are accessing our um, meal distribution daily. So where do I, instead of having my homeless awareness poster up in an office, how can I get that information out at the food distribution sites, our technology distribution? Um, also pushing into, uh, we have an advisory um, class that's consistent across all of our grades, all of our schools, um, and every Wednesday is a wellness Wednesday. So I'm jumping on that and, you know, within the first few weeks, there's going to be a lesson on um, COVID and how that's impacted housing stability and homelessness and, you know, um, what are the different qualifications for uh, a McKinney Vento supports. Um, so that's an opportunity there. Um, so, you know, identify and then also, like I said, making sure that all of our school websites that our COVID services and resources site um, that all of those places have awareness about what it means to qualify for these services and also you know, for our foster youth as well. But um, utilizing that to educate our students and families to self-identify, I think that's one of the things I've been focused on. And then this is Jennifer. And um, so part of it does go back to, to um, just rem reminding districts to see who's, who's not there again, because some of those students that are not showing up may be experiencing homelessness. And so we have advocated for districts to have some type of kind of, um, on, I guess, on the ground individuals who are making those trips out to check on families. Um, I know this is an odd time for COVID, but um, that face-to-face -face just to double check on a family is really important. Um, I know we are advocating for doing a lot of phone calling, but when the phone calling stops working, um, there has to be somebody that uh, takes the ability and the responsibility of going out and doing what they can to um, connect with their families. Um, the school housing questionnaire um, has always been um, an issue. It, it, we do under-identify. We, we had an awful report come out from the state in November about under-identification. So, I really work with districts to look at their, um, their free and reduced lunch populations, as well as their low socioeconomic populations, and really look at the, the data and the statistics behind those numbers, and that whether they're hitting um, what they call the best practice benchmarks for that five to 10% um, for those, for those um, free and reduced and low socioeconomic. Um, the other things we try to do is really to um, have districts think through. And again, each district is different and their capacity is different. So just like Melissa talked about is, is what are creative ways that you can um, be reaching out? What does that look like in your district? If you're doing, and my big advocacy has been, if you're doing online enrollment, you need to make sure that whoever is your liaison has immediate access to your online enrollment information for identification, because if not, that's a problem. So you have to work with your data team now to make sure that you have access to that information immediately so that you can service those families immediately. So just a few things. And just to, just to add from, um, so from my research, one of the most important things is care relationships. And the uh, individuals that, that disclose, they disclose because they establish a caring relationship during the time they were actually experiencing homelessness. Um, so like one of the research was showing is how that, how that kind of comes about is one, um, a teacher um, or an adult in school showing universal care for all their students um, to a point where now the, the individual child now feels comfortable in that space. 
um, then making an actual personal relationship with those individual students. So now having universal care, and now actually you show an interest in me, um, not just as a student, but also as a person. Um, and then also having some opportunity for me to actually disclose. Um, so informal time where I actually have with, um, with adults in school that allows me to actually talk a little bit more about myself and also disclose something like this. And oftentimes um, most, most uh, students don't have all three of those things in place in order for them to actually feel comfortable disclosing. So I think it's really important that we also focus on relationships and utilize teachers because um, often that I do like professional developments in like school districts across the country. And one of the biggest things I noticed is that teachers don't know the McKinney Mental Homeless, Homeless Citizens Act um, definition. So they'll know, um, they know the kids are living with um, you know, a cousin and stuff like that. They have all this information, but they're never connected to actually the homeless, the homeless experience. And for me, um, as an individual that experienced homelessness, um, and coming from a, a disenfranchised community, I, have, I know so many people who are experiencing it that I, I become numb to it, even when I was a teacher. So I, I just knew, oh, like, you know, so-and-so, same as auntie, um, that was just normal. And so I never thought, about, thought of it as there's actual rights and actual services that they actually can have, um, be entitled to that can help support them. Um, I kind of normalized it because it was a part of my experience too. So I think it goes both ways in terms of it being a bias and people who were privileged never have to think about it, but also those who grew up in um, adverse um, environments to see this as kind of being normal and um, something you kind of have to overcome. So I think it's really important that we are, are instilling in our teachers and our um, support staff and that having other support staff to actually support them as well to be able to have themselves open um, to do it. So some examples is um, having um, office hours, right? You have office hours for your students and also for parents, where they can kind of just tune in, come and just talk about different things that are going on um, within, the, within the learning, but also things that might be coming up. And that's an opportunity, one, to kind of give like a, a nod to different programs and services that individuals can take advantage of, but also just know what's going on within the, within the school environment. Um, having more opportunities like that well, or definitely increase the likelihood of us knowing who is experiencing homelessness and what's going on in their experiences versus us waiting for three or four absences and then calling um, randomly and, and not, um, not being happy when they don't answer our phone call because they're not used to us calling them and actually interacting with them. And I'd, I'd just like to add to what Earl is saying because um, I think I take for granted that relationship building. We have small schools where we have no more than about 600 students on a campus and relationships are really big. Um, and it's a part of the school culture and climate conversations that we're having with our teachers. But especially in this you know, time of technology, something Earl said really like struck me because it did lead me to think that, you know, oftentimes these very um, nuanced conversations in between classes as classes are, you know, changing, students are filtering out and a student might go and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a teacher. And that's oftentimes where our teachers are finding out about a student's life circumstances. And now that doesn't exist in like the tech world. So how do you create those opportunities like Earl said? And I know that some districts are even looking at this idea of like um, outreach periods. So you have X number of periods which are for your synchronous teaching and then a teacher is, you know, built into their contract or whatever is like this period of outreach where you're getting on the phone and calling all the kids in your advisory class or calling all the kids in your English class or whatever it is. So yeah, I think creating those um, opportunities to also help identify and just a quick plug for Schoolhouse Connection which is you know, a great resource. Um, I'm also on their Facebook page. And um, I think they just said just this week, they're actually gonna be putting out something on um, warning signs of homelessness within a, a virtual um, world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking out for that myself to see you know, what kind of advice they have there. Thanks everyone. I'm just going to close out with one more question. Um, Charles, it seems like this might be a good one for you. Someone asked, um, what are some ways that people can get involved to support students experiencing homelessness and how um, opportunities might be different sort of in the, the COVID moment that we're in? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that there's so many organizations right now that are doing some amazing work. Um, and uh, tutoring, obviously, I think is a very important need right now that most schools face. Um, I would, I mean, there's so many, so many ways you can help. We as an organization right now, we have a, 
a hold on our uh, volunteer application process. Um, but we, what we are doing is we're, we're trying to think outside of the box collectively to figure out how we can get people engaged. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're organizing a virtual backpack supply drives um, where volunteers can set up a page or corporations and these backpacks can be delivered directly to families experiencing homelessness. So that way you limit kind of person to person contact. Um, one of the other things that we did during the summer um, is that a lot of students need packet work as well um, to do um, in conjunction with some of the online learning that they'll be doing. So we've been asking volunteers to organize uh, student worksheets and we can actually get to students so that they have um, work that they can do when they're not accessing um, information online. Um, but again, for me, there, I, I would just look for any um, local organization that you can work with to get involved. Um, I think everybody kind of alluded to this, but it takes community involvement and it's gonna take, I think, even more community involvement now in order to like really support these kids. So even us just kind of going back to the question prior, what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate our volunteers more because a lot of our students do face the stigma of being homeless and the fear. And a lot of them don't uh, actually notify the schools to let them know um, about their living situation. So we as an organization, we're trying to provide a lot more resource resources to our families, um, just so they know what their rights are um, and what they have access to because of their living situations. But I think there's so many organizations that you can get involved with. Us being one, reach out to us. Um, we'll continue to figure out ways that we can um, get more people involved because I think that um, this is definitely a time that we all need to kind of pull our weight and, 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 and do a little bit more. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. I know we're at the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists. I think um, both our researchers and practitioners. For the practitioners, um, we would love to hear from you to, to have a better sense of what kind of research you would like us as a research community to do to inform your work and to be more effective. Um, and vice versa, I could say on behalf of the research community, just hearing you talk about what you're facing day to day is really helpful for us to think about how best to formulate our research as well. So we really look at HPRI as an opportunity to exchange those ideas and practices. Um, I, I think everybody got a terrific sense of how much you do with so little resources and, and really just um, for all of us who have kids who were, you know, in LA County or you know, or grandkids or, or wherever. I mean, this is an issue that really does take the full community to support each other right now. And, and so I really appreciate all of your work, Charles, Melissa, and Jennifer, you know, your different levels, you know, the high levels are on the ground and within school charter networks. And um, I just look forward to figuring out ways that we as a research community can support you as effectively as possible. So with that, we'll go ahead and close today. And again, thank you, everybody. And thank you for everyone in the audience for joining us.